Diplomacy is what you're talking about, is where politics get, is productive. Mm -hmm. and, and the problem is, is that, as you said, most of that is under the, you know, under the hood. You know, we don't see right. that happening, and so we can easily pretend it's not happening. Right. But all those solutions are being worked on even as and, we speak. And that's 99.9% .9 of the solutions yeah. are not military. Yeah. And yet our discussion of, like, you yourself, like, politics is ultimately like the point of gun. Actually, yeah. it's, most of the time it's not. Yeah, cool. Um, yeah, but, uh, but, but sitting here in this country, where we can, you know, more directly affect change, what is the model? What has been a similar um, situation in the past, and what has succeeded in addressing that situation? And clearly, the anti-apartheid uh, movement was a model. Mm -hmm. And what we saw was an effort last fall, a valiant effort on campuses, to, uh, to start to um, affect that kind of model. And we saw that really shut down. And that is really troubling. Mm -hmm. Troubling on so many different levels. And, you know, I, I talk about this all the time because my husband is Jewish. And what is really troubling to me, deeply troubling, um, is I'm trying to do this without. Uh, is that there are right wing Jewish organizations that are strongly anti Palestinian and yet not anti Nazi. And not anti what? Not Nazi. anti Nazi. Mm -hmm. Not opposing the Nazism in the Republican Party. Mm -hmm. And there's a significant, significant scheme of Nazism sure. in the current Republican Party. Mm -hmm. And there is deathly silence. Mm -hmm. Deathly silence. Mm -hmm. And in fact, support by extremely wealthy conservative Jewish groups or Jewish individuals. And yet, when it comes to trying to affect the sort of anti-apartheid model from a you know from a US perspective, stopping investments, enforcing US laws that prohibit support of governments that oppose humanitarian measures, humanitarian aid, death based on mm -hmm. And that is really troubling. I mean, I certainly understand right now, at this moment in time, the need to really um, defeat Trump, defeat fascism in this country. But what comes after that? And you know, if 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 Kamala wins, and she runs a brilliant campaign, and I I feel very optimistic. But if she wins, what what they what then is our position? Mm -hmm. She's Christians. Mm -hmm. Judy, yeah. The question kind of still goes back to the Arab states, and and they're so. Uh, they're not very progressive, obviously, but. Sometimes war can be a movement, something to move culturally in a better direction. And so kind of similarly, I wonder if this war continues, where will, we, where will they end up in particular? Um, it, could this be beneficial in some way? Hmm. Um, well, you'd like to think that something could could come out of yeah. it, but you know that's yeah, but, again a, that might be a little optimistic. Is that? Coming? I mean, I think one of the at least one thought, thought is that the reason October seventh happened was because the Arab, because several Arab countries were moving towards accepting Israel, and so that Hamas puts them in a position where they can't. Um, so I think that that's you know that Saudi Arabia was about to was about to recognize Israel, and then. If I can provoke an attack from Israel, mm -hmm. Saudi Arabia won't do it. All right, throw a whole monkey so, wrench in that. It was pretty strategic, yeah. So, yeah. yeah. So, uh, yeah. I think I think if you make, if you if you make everything extreme, then you force people to choose sides. And see, that's the problem with the polarization line. Right? Then it's either with me or against me. And you know, m many of us remember. Many of us remember black and white televisions where you had the contrast button and you turned it all the way up it was really black and white you couldn't make out what was on the screen so uh, you know the fact is we black and white you know those dichotomies just don't work anymore but people are just so eager to establish them we we need more than black and white we need 
Can I say Fifty Shades of Grey? Can I? Is that still? <laughs> does that still work? I don't know. <laughs> but I mean, the world isn't even it isn't isn't even just you know shades of gray. It's color. There's so much nuance and and subtlety there that um, you know. I mean, at, you know, as someone who just looks for nuance, it's it's extremely dis disconcerting to see people being so polemic. Yeah. Well, I guess I wonder to what extent this goes to your area of expertise in terms of like people's identity. Like I think that there are sort of I derive meaning from an identity, or people derive meanings from identities that may or may not, or working to derive meaning from your identity may not be completely aligned with achieving sort of practical success in some way that would make sense to an outsider. Can you give like, me an example? So, so I guess I'm just thinking about the people who are, um, Sort of giving to sort of what is the meaning of the state of Israel mean to people's identity? Like I assume that that people are supporting Israel and that this difficulty of un, uh, of separating Zionism from anti-Semitism mm -hmm. has to go to to me goes to issues of identity and how to identify myself in in meaning and I think that. To me, I also see a connection between the leader of Hamas deciding that it is preferable to provoke a war in which Gazans will be decimated yeah. than to see Saudi Arabia acknowledge Israel. Mm -hmm. Like That feels like an identity issue of what does it mean to be a Palestinian and I mean, not that everybody shares that belief of what it means, but we see people, I see people acting to preserve their identity more than anything else. Mm -hmm. Even, yeah, even, yeah, even yeah, when I it's counterproductive. It's right, right. Even when it's I mean, not really in their own best interest. Right, right. So I, but this feels like a dynamic that has been going on for forever and strikes me as connected to people's religious identities and what they oh, do. Oh, for sure. The, I mean, look at the history of, well, look at the history of Christianity, look at the history of Judaism, look at the history of Islam. I mean, it's, it's always been, I mean, from the very beginning, arguably the founders of these religions were sincerely visionary spiritual people. Let's give them credit for that. <laughs> but, um, but very quickly, it becomes clear that religion gets co-opted by political interests, by, you know, yeah, uh, no, for sure. And I'm not saying that necessarily in a bad way, but institute, let's, let, let's leave the word politics out of it. Let's say institutional, you know, because it becomes, and really, like for instance, you know, the, the priesthood came along later in Judaism. I mean, it's like, you know, the, the early Israelites, the Hebrews, were practicing all kinds of religious practices without a priest. You used to be able to, pra to do your own sacrifices. I mean, in the book of Job, Job does his own sacrifices. But once the, the, once the power consolidates in the priesthood, mm -hmm. it becomes the case that only the priest can perform the sacrifices, and only at the cultic center, the tabernacle or the temple, when it gets ultimately built. Mm -hmm. So people have to come from all around to, and pay the, the, the temple, pay the priesthood to do their sacrifices. And, and of course, all the abuses and excesses there, because then, um, you know, then there's all kinds of, you know, it costs people money to stay places, and they're and they're selling trinkets in the outside the temple. And this is why Jesus gets upset, inside right? Inside the temple, and, oh yeah, all over. The, and so basically, the whole story of Jesus overturning the money changers' tables. Mm -hmm. Why do they need money changers' tables? It's because people are coming from all over the Roman Empire, because there are Jewish communities now all over the Roman Empire, and they're coming into into Jerusalem to do the sacrifice. They all have to convert to the local currency to pay the priesthood. And what happens? We've all I'm sure we're all sophisticated people here. What happens when you exchange currency? You lose, you lose currency, right? <laughs> so, I mean, they're sucking the lives out of these poor, you know, pious pilgrims, you know, and, uh, and, and they're just, it's the psychophantic, parasitic industry. And so, arguably, Jesus' role there, as far as I can see, was to reform Judaism was to say, you know, let's get back to where we once belonged, as John Lennon said. He, comes, I, he says, I come not to abolish the law, but to 
pleurisy it, which can mean to fulfill or to complete. But